everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Shane Snipes, and you're watching the Egypt Show here at BMCC. I'm so excited to have today one of my special guests, uh, Jessica Santana, who is truly a vanguard in the space of tech in New York City. She has brought so much to the table. She's created many initiatives. Uh, she's also collaborated with so many different people. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. I always like to, in these chats, to start from the very beginning, so we'll start with that. But I want to tell you a little bit more about her. She actually co-founded the New York on Tech uh, organization. And from that, they've done a lot of different programs that really help build support for youth who want to learn about tech and specifically focused on people from diverse backgrounds and making sure we really open up this space of technology to other types of um, groups of people, whether it's people with disabilities or women or people from other ethnicities or people who bring all kinds of different views and perspectives to the technology world. And it's really important also that there are so many youth in New York City who may or may not have access to getting the right kind of education or even seeing the opportunities that exist in the technology world. Even if they're not necessarily wanting to be a programmer, maybe they're wanting to do product management or maybe they're wanting to do some other aspect of technology, just opening their minds and hearts to what that is. You know, this guy has been such a great advocate in that space and continues to move in all kinds of realms, whether it's American Express is emerging innovator or Wells Fargo's millennial activist. Uh, she works with organizations like Ashoka, has also worked and talked in all kinds of spaces. Uh, if you're in the tech world, you know about TechCrunch and um, Google for Entrepreneurs. She's been in all of these places. It's pretty amazing. She uh, is truly an inspiration to me, and I know she's going to be an inspiration to you guys too, the students who are watching this. So please welcome Jessica. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. That was such a wonderful introduction. I'm really happy to be here with you all this afternoon. Yeah, and you are like me. You're like out in New York City, getting things done, doing the things that you need to do, like popping off from one meeting, doing this, this next thing. Uh, and I know, like, you're like, oh no, the trains aren't getting me where I need to go. And you like jump out and get your things done. I want, I want us to recognize that that's where you are and what you're doing right now for us, and and providing us this information and insight uh, any way that you can and getting it done. So thank you again for, for meeting me today. No, of course. I love students. I think education is extremely important. So any knowledge that I can impart on the next generation regarding business and entrepreneurship and technology, I make sure to always make myself available. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. And so, Jessica, tell me a little bit. We're going to start out from the very, very beginning. Um, what were some of the things when you were in school, um, in college and in high school, transitioning from high school to college, that really kind of showed you part of your path? You know, looking back now, what were some of those key moments that really kind of transformed or, or helped you on your way? Yeah, you know, so I was the first person in my family to graduate from college with a four-year degree. I was also the first person in my family to go ahead and obtain a graduate education. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and, you know, unfortunately, um, the schools that I went to a lot of times, there wasn't a lot of resources. There weren't a lot of resources available to young people, you know, from the community that I'm from. And I think that while I never um, will take that uh, and kind of make an excuse for um, not wanting to be successful or, you know, kind of creating, um, you know, a, a narrative around, you know, the, the fact that, like, you know, when you're from these communities, like, it's hard for you to, um, like, get resources. I think the one thing that was really foundational, you know, regardless of whether or not I had resources was the fact that I had a strong foundation when it came to my family, and I also had a lot of mentors um, who were encouraging me in some way or form. These mentors came in the form of teachers. They also came in front uh, in the form of some, um, you know, people who were in corporate America at the time through certain access to after school programs that weren't necessarily in the neighborhood that I was from, but I would commute into places like Manhattan from Brooklyn in order to receive those services. And I think that um, the one thing that I'll say about that is that it put into perspective that I was actually really lucky. Um, while I grew up in a low-income community, I was able to identify certain things that can help me along the way. 
Um, and two, I was able to now, you know, take those experiences to do what I'm doing now with New York on Tech and be very passionate and be very uh, relentless about making sure that our organization is accessible, is as accessible as possible to young people across the city. Um, so learning moments for me were, you know, realizing that, you know, I was one of the only women, the only people of color who actually was in uh, a job or, you know, even in my graduate program in technology um, and having, you know, being able to come back and actually like create opportunities for young people and innovation. Um, so I think it was a combination of like where I'm from, um, the things that I value, which is obviously service and a community, but then it was also merging those two passions to making sure that I was always going to be a catalyst for change um, and a positive representation of where I'm from and what I represent. Yeah, I, I love to get my students to ask to pose questions and, and read about the people that I'm going to talk to. Uh, and I did that in this case, and quite a few of them came up with really great questions for you. So throughout this uh, chat that we're having, I want to pose some of those questions. So one of their first okay. questions that the students ask is, you, know, you came from a very similar background to most of the students who go to BNCC, and they really do have a hard time concentrating, staying focused, and being in the moment. And they said, how, do you, how did you do that? How did you, in your first few years of college, really stay in that time? to strive for your goal and to obtain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to be honest with you, you know, the first year of college was really difficult because while I exceeded expectations academically and I graduated with my degree with honors, it was not something that was easy to do. Um, I was literally on a campus that was completely different from any educational experience I had up to that point. You know, I went to public schools my entire life. My entire public education felt extremely uh, strapped with resources. And then finally, I was at a campus that had over 300 recognized student organizations. There was a lot of wealth around me. There were a lot of resources around me. My university had an office of multicultural affairs and so even during the moments where I felt like I was experiencing imposter syndrome there were resources readily available to me whether it be um, you know mentally or academically that I could leverage um, in order for me to kind of like overcome some of the challenges that I experienced. So when it comes to focus, I think one is understanding what your end goal is. I think a lot of times, you know, when you're in the in the moment and you're kind of moving with emotions, it's difficult for you to understand that the goal is for you to get the degree because everything around you just seems like it's, um, you know, against you or sometimes, you know, I think for me, my biggest uh, challenge in college was no, not so much on the academic side, but making sure that I knew that I belonged there and that I wasn't any less than anyone else. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is just making sure that in the moments where I am feeling challenged or I'm feeling like there might not be, um, you know, my answers to questions that I have is that I'm actively looking for um, you know, people and organizations or departments that actually can help me fill those gaps. And so I think what worked for me in some is one, understanding that my end goal was to get my education because I knew that that was going to be an avenue out of poverty for me. Two, understanding that um, I belonged in the place that I was and I deserved to at least try um, to be my best while on campus. And then three was supplementing, you know, the gaps that I experienced while on campus, even if sometimes, um, you know, it was difficult at first to identify the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, um, and getting them on board to helping me, like, you know, address some of the concerns that I had moving forward. Sure, sure. Uh, that's such great advice. And uh... I also wanted to follow that up with um, what I thought was a really powerful question from one of my students that said, I know nothing about tech. Tech scares me, and I don't even know where to begin. I don't feel like I'm good at math, so how do I get into this thing? Yes, it's so interesting because I think that the narrative around tech right now is that you have to be an engineer or you have to be 
coder. And there are so many opportunities in technology that don't require real engineering or coding skills. You know, technology companies have HR departments, technology companies have, um, you know, design departments, they have management departments, they have operations. And so I think it's not so much about you needing to have technical skills in a career within tech. I think it's aligning yourself with what you're already good at and then finding um, companies that are offering positions of employment within um, the skill set that you already have. So I'll say that one. And then two, I think that if you are looking to develop some kind of technical skills, there's so many resources available online from codecademy.com, Khan Academy, Udemy, um, where you can go ahead and at least dabble in some of the skills that employers are currently looking for. So if you did want to transition into a more technical role, you already have some experience with doing so on your own and creating projects on your own. And I think the last thing is don't be scared. Technology is in need of students just like you who are diverse, who are excited, who are hungry. And the reality of the situation is that over the next 10 years, there's going to be 500,000 plus jobs in this industry that are making more than two or three times the annual median wage across the United States. I think starting level salaries in this industry is about 85,000. Um, $85,000 per year. So I think from an economic standpoint, you should absolutely not be afraid. If anything, I would say you need to position yourself to take advantage of the movement that is digital first right now, because um, I kind of see it as we are either going to have to adapt our skill sets to changing times or we're going to be left behind. Yeah, yeah, such powerful words and so wise, so wise. And to be so young and so wise like yourself, <laughs> you are you are it's amazing uh you bring so much to the table and uh i want you to tell us a little bit about why you started the you know new york city on tech and, and our tech in, on new york and why why that really came to your heart and, and what it really was yeah you know i think so when i started my career in technology after i graduated from grad school I was making about four or five times my family's annual household income. And so it really shifted for me the way that I saw economic opportunities um, in this industry. I think the other thing I saw was that there was a huge disparity in my um, corporate environment that either didn't have that, dis that had true disproportionate representation of women and people of color and even the intersectionality of people, you know, well, you know, people who have disabilities and people who come from the LGBTQIA plus community. You know, sometimes the hiring systems weren't accessible to them, nor were they inclusive. And I think that it got me and my co-founder thinking one day, well, how was it possible that coming from the community that we're from and then being able to be the first in our family to, you know, actually obtain a degree and a career in this industry, what were the things that we needed or what the things that we had been exposed to that young people are currently not being exposed to that truly let, leave them behind? And at the time, you know, there was a lot of talk about Brooklyn becoming the next um, Silicon Valley, yet, you know, a lot of the employment positions of you know, people who were from the community, they didn't even know anything that was going on in places like, you know, what was called the Brooklyn Tech Triangle at one point in time, and they didn't know anything about what Silicon Alley was. They didn't understand meetups. They didn't understand any of those things. But I think we wanted to democratize access to that information. And as a result of that, you know, we started with a modest 20 students in 2014, really coming from a place of wanting to serve them and expose them to opportunities in this industry and it wasn't until you know literally six months into our pilot program that we realized that this was an organization that if we wanted to continue to grow um, we can take full time so we ended up getting a grant for fifty thousand dollars with the contingency of one of us taking the work full time and um, at that point I decided to take the work full time and my co-founder followed me a little bit after that and so you know what started out uh, out of out of a place of wanting to serve with 20 students has grown to an organization that has worked with more than a thousand students in the past four years across the five boroughs. Um, but you know, when I think about the why behind it, I think it's one, you know, students are really truly 
being left out of innovation. I think two uh, women and people of color a lot of times are the ones that are some of the ones that are the most you know left behind. Um, and three, I think there's a huge economic opportunity in this industry that has an, that has the potential to really shift um, you know the way that you know we think about engaging you know this important population of people in the future workforce. Yeah, let's talk just for a minute or two about that because I like I like that you, when you think about the overarching objective, the overarching goal of New York on tech and, and what it really looks like, do you think there's a way to measure your impact? Absolutely, for sure. I think that a lot of times, um, so we, we at New York on Tech, we don't see ourselves as just an organization that is giving workshops to students. You know, our programs are anywhere between 10 weeks and nine months. And so, you know, part of the impact that we're measuring for us is one, developing key performance indicators that show what's kind of skills students come into the program with versus what kind of skills they leave the program with. Um, two, tracking how they perform in our internship program with employers and also being able to take the data that the employers say about their skill sets and quantifying that for the future and, you know, leveraging that same data to either make improvements on our curriculum um, or improvements to the program itself. Um, and then three, actually, um, you know, quantifying how many of our alumni from these courses have actually gone into the workforce in a job in technology or a degree in technology. And so I think that we see ourselves as an early pipeline tech talent accelerator more than just an exposure program because there's one thing to expose a student and there's another thing to really accelerate their skills. So we see ourselves as a next step for students and Gen Z who really want to position themselves for long-term um, opportunities in the tech industry. So at this point, it's not so much about um, exposure for us, it's really more about acceleration. Mm, yeah, that's a great point and a really important distinction too. I also would like to know, um, Starting an organization is different than working for one. Yeah. And when you are, when you decide to start something, when you decide to create something, there may be some of those early moments when you're doing it where you're not sure which direction to go or how you're going to do this thing. If you could take a couple of steps back and think about that, could you describe what that was like for you and, and how you got some of those initial decisions made? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we started off with like literally just some money we raised during a launch event to kick us off with our pilot. I think it was about $10,000. And then we ended up getting the $50,000 that ultimately was the decision in us taking it full time. But I think what a lot of people don't know is not like, you know, after we got that $50,000, there was more money coming to the door. No, we really needed to develop a you know, a fundraising strategy, a foundation strategy, an individual giving strategy. We had to like figure out program refinement, really operationalize a lot of the things that we were doing so that um, certain tasks were automated. We had to figure out payroll systems. We had to figure out more than, it's like running a, a, a nonprofit business is more than just like, you know, doing good for the community. It's really a business. And so we've needed to figure out insurance. We needed to have, you know, make sure that our audits were in place and that our accounting and our books were reconciled every month. And so these were the things that in retrospect, no one really told us about and some that we just realized um, that would either make or break the success of our organization because it's one thing to do good for the community. It's another thing to treat the organization with the diligence that it needs to be treated in order for it to be a sustainable business in the long term. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, we're four years in and there's certain things that we're still operationalizing, still things that we are, you know, creating for our curriculum, more curriculum that's rolling out. We learn something new every single year because students change all the time. And so I think um, you know, when you're building something, I would say that the love that you have for what you're doing, you know, really is the kind of the the adrenaline that you need in order to get over, you know, the hump. You know, when we first started, we didn't have any staff. Now we have 10 staff members. And so I think it's, you know, really thinking about um, 
you know, creating a roadmap for success. Um, Cause I think a lot of times if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. But I think the one thing that we did really early on was really think about, you know, the processes by which we would implement our courses and then also automate a lot of the things that we didn't have to, you know, worry about that we didn't really want to worry about because of the fact that they would take away from our long-term strategy. Um, and I'll also say that, you know, don't be afraid to um, say no to things also. I think in the very beginning, because of the fact that it was, you know, I mean, I still consider us a growing organization, you know, but when we were, you know, when it was the beginning, you know, we got a lot of, you know, press and a lot of like attention because it was new and it was fun. And maybe even me from a mental health standpoint was learning to say no to opportunities more so that I could focus on my own mental health and work-life balance. And so I will say that it's still something that, you know, I'm very much trying to figure out. I don't know that I have a specific answer for it, but I will say that, um, you know, operationalizing is important. I think your mental health is important. I think your time management is important. Um, and I also think thinking about your sales strategy is important for growth as well. That's great. Um, and and I'll, I'll add to that in the sense that, all those pieces and parts that you were talking about that you had to figure out. Um, oftentimes students ask me, why am I taking an entrepreneurship class? Why aren't I just making a company right now? And I go, well, you could do that. I mean, there's there's a way you can like come up with an idea and just start trying to do it. Um, but that means that you're gonna make a lot more mistakes and you're gonna have to like be constantly scrambling trying to figure out what is insurance? How do I figure out what my final costs are? How do I employ my people? How do I recruit people? What's my, you know, all those pieces come into it. So while people kind of look down sometimes at entrepreneurship education, I have to say, I wish I had had it when I started my first organization. Because I was like you, like I started my first organization right out of college and I was just like, oh my God, my head's going to explode. I got all these things coming at me. Which one do I do first? How do I do it? And just figuring it out on the fly. Um, mm -hmm. And there is something to be said for those types of entrepreneurship entrepreneurs too. Um, I want to follow that up with a couple of detailed questions. One is you talk about um, running your nonprofit a little bit more like a business. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you do that? Because a lot of our students think of nonprofits as like, okay, I have to go out and get a bunch of grant money and that's the only way I'm ever going to start a nonprofit. That's the only way I'm ever going to have any kind of social good type business in mind. Um, what was, what were your ways that you brought that into, into fruition in terms of making it more like a business? Yeah, absolutely. I think the best thing you can do as a nonprofit that I encourage any nonprofit to do is don't only have a theory of change in terms of how you will operationalize the things in your program that make it a really good program, but I think um, nonprofits should also have a business model canvas. You know, the the things that like really create framework around the value proposition that you are not only solving for the beneficiaries of your organization, but that you are solving for the potential customers. You know, I think that people don't realize that in the nonprofit sector, you can also have an earned revenue strategy. You can sell to schools, you can sell to other nonprofits, you can sell to for-profits, you can have, you know, a B2B, a B2C strategy, however it is that you want to do it. Um, but I think the most important exercise in the beginning stages for you to think about, you know, running your organization as a business is, you know, to reference a lot of business, you know, model canvassing um, templates that are available online. I will also say, you know, look into theories like, you know, Blue Ocean Strategy, because even while we, you know, were a, a nonprofit, I still felt like we were driving a lot of value to potential employers. And I also felt like we were adding and driving a lot of value to technology companies that were looking for, you know, access to diverse talent and diverse audiences. And so for me, they were obviously our potential customers. Um, and then as time has evolved, you know, we've included to, you know, have value in our curriculum. Now our curriculum is a source of earned revenue. So as you think about um, ways, you should think about how your services are actual things you can sell, whether you're selling the program itself or you're selling your intellectual property as an organization or you're selling activation. It really is 
um, up to you on how you decide to craft it. But nonprofits are more than just these things that raise money uh, to keep a cause going, uh, to keep a cause going on. Um, I think for us, obviously, we still do fundraising and we fundraise from individuals because it really helps us with our general operating support. Um, but, you know, we, we're looking at other ways that we drive value that people would actually want to pay for. So the same way that, you know, any, um, you know, technology company would want their, you know, users to pay for their services, we would want our users to pay for our services and if it's not our users paying for our services then it is the um people who are the intermediaries between our users and our and and um how do we get to our users in the first place if that makes sense that's great that's great uh another question is how do you scale like what were your what was your scaling strategy and um talk about the early stages i always like the the beginning pieces of scaling because it lets students know that scaling isn't just a percentage increase in funds. It's something quite different when you actually go out to do it, or as you said a couple of couple of times, when you operationalize scaling, it looks and feels different than what it looked like on paper. What were some of those changes that happened? Yeah. So so in the beginning, you know, we didn't even try to scale. I think the what we did was we went to what we knew, which was our personal relationships and our networks. And so the two schools that we sourced students from that first year, we had people who um, we knew in those schools and they were teachers in those schools and they said, hey, you know, yes, we'll be part of your pilot. Let's see where we can take this. And then as time, time passed on, you know, those two teachers, those two schools, through the nine, then to 27, and now more than 50 schools. But for us, our strategy has been really word of mouth because we're still working within community and when you're working within community you have to build credibility you also have to build um, you have to build credibility and you have to build trust uh, with your constituent base and so for us the school scaling process has been very um, word of mouth and very organic and now we get a lot of inbound inquiries from schools who want to partner with us and so scaling for us took the approach of grassroots, um, you know, organizing and relationship building, but now we also have a way for anyone who's interested in, um, you know, partnering with us, making it as easy as they, they go to our website, they sign up, and then there's someone on our team that's dedicated to following up with more information about what we do. Um, I will also say when scaling, um, make sure that your quality of service um, is not compromised. You know, after year two, after year one of building the organization, we had so much um, inquiry from schools all across the city. And if we weren't intentional in year two, we would have, we could have had a hundred you know, more than 100 schools, but there were more, there were not enough of us and we didn't have the funding. And so we had to create a wait list of schools. And so if we were to scale for the sake of scaling, you know, year two would have been the, the year where we went from two to 100. And then we realized, you know, I think for the young people in our programs, our scale has to match where we currently are at as an organization. And so sometimes you scale and you're not ready for that level of commitment. And then as a result of that, you really damage the relationships that you have with people who are supporting you and people in the community who are supporting you. And so I think that, you know, it's even year four now, we're still not working with 100 schools. We're working with more than 50, but, you know, we still have a wait list of partners who want to be involved in our organization. And it's truly because we don't, we don't want to take partners on that we don't feel that we could deliver high quality service to. And so sometimes scaling, um, you know, when you're thinking about it, it should be intentional. It should match what your current organizational capacity is. And it should also make sure that, you know, you can actually deliver on your promise because, you know, the beneficiaries, which for us are our students, really come first before anyone else in our organization or anything else um, in our organization. Yeah, yeah, that's such great advice. That's such great advice. I'm seeing and have seen uh, in the last few years being in New York City again, I see companies that scale and then I see them shutter later, especially certain coffee shops that grow too big, right? Um, Fika is a perfect example. People have seen Fika coffee shops all over the place, and now they're all they're shuttering. And so there's there's something to be said for when whether it's for profit or nonprofit, you have 
if you're meeting a need and you're creating a high quality product, tons of people come to get your product. They want it. They're excited. They hear about it, right? Um, and that's a great place to be. You know you're on the right track as far as building your organization at that point. So kudos to you for making that choice and, and making those types of wise decisions. Um, there's a reason why you're, you've won all these awards and you're such an amazing woman. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so one of the things I also wanted to follow up with you on is how did you come up with the initial idea? Mm -hmm. Um, Starbucks napkins. It was me and my co-founder. We were literally at a Starbucks um, and we were just venting about, um, you know, just like the lack of diversity within our current jobs. And then also, you know, those, I think that frustration started um, getting us at, to ask bigger questions about how did we get here versus how do other people get left behind? And so uh, during that day in the Starbucks, we started asking ourselves, well, like, well, what were the things that happened in our academic and our professional trajectories that allowed us to have this uh, access to a degree in a career in technology? Um, and essentially all those factors that we wrote down became the blueprint for um, how we run the organization under our four pillars, which include development, mentoring, network, and access, which is access to the technical skills, access to the mentors, access to the relationships, and then access to the professional experiences that, you know, come together to make um, someone be able to matriculate into a degree in technology, graduate from it, and then obviously obtain employment within the industry. Wow. So it, it like, it's a story. In many ways, it's, it's like a storybook of of what they say and how you initially build something comes from some need or desire or something that you you perceive and then going in there and actually defining it specifically. Uh, what what role do you think um, a co-founder plays in, in making an organization a success? Yes. So, you know, my co-founder, Evan Robinson, I love him to death. Him and I really have complementary skill sets. And I think the one thing that we have in common, though, is the passion that we have for what we're doing. So I think the one thing that I can always count on Evan on is making sure that, you know, we have the same vision for where we want the organization to go. And then because I may be really good at one thing and he may be really good at others, it's really easy for us to streamline the you know roles and responsibilities that each of us is gonna play. I will also say that in the early stages of building something and you don't have any staff, I can't tell you how many you know days and nights I was able to call Evan and just lean in on him and express my concerns and you know him being that voice of reasoning a lot of times and then vice versa when he was in a certain mood and he you know was experiencing certain challenges, me being that voice of reasoning for him played a huge role as well. And so I would say co-founder related relationships are extremely important. You know, I support solo founders. I think they are also they are obviously capable of doing things, but I think for me having had Evan was um, you know, a great pleasure in the past 4 years he's been a wonderful person to work with. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Wow. Uh, kudos. Good. It sounds like you guys have an amazing co-founder relationship and that's really what it requires to grow something and to be around each other for four years for, and for all those hours of time that it takes to build something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. All right. So I wanted to thank you for your time and energy and, and to close things out and to kind of let the students know, um, I'd love for you if you have something that particularly for you is inspiring or inspirational. What are those types of things that you that keep you going in the morning, that keep you going through the week, that keep you going through the month and through the year, uh, that might inspire some of the people who are listening and watching and watching this? Mm -hmm. Yes, have self appreciation days. You know, so I think that when you're in the process of building something, whether it's your career as an entrepreneur or your business as an entrepreneur, I think it's extremely important to set time aside to reflect. Um, I have these day days called Jessica Appreciation Days. Those are Sundays. Those are the times where I do the things that are important to me, which is family, you know, getting my house in order, journaling, writing, um, and goal setting. And so 
I think the best thing I did, you know, since college, because Jessica Appreciation Days have been going on since like 2007, um, is just making sure that my Sundays, unless truly necessary, um, are just dedicated for my own personal development and my own self growth um, and doing things that are more on the selfish side. Um, where it doesn't involve anyone else as part of my process and my journey, but more things that I'm doing to keep myself, you know, sane and keeping myself healthy and happy. Amazing. Jessica, you're an inspiration. Oh, thank you so much. This has been a lot, a lot of fun. And I hope the students do get something out of it. Oh, they certainly will. And it's going to be around for a long time as, as people come and visit us and see things going on. And I, I look forward to an opportunity, hopefully, where the students can meet you in person one day. Yes, I would love that. All right, everyone. Thanks so much today. I wanted to thank Jessica Santana for her time. Uh, her organi organization, New York on Tech, uh, is one of those organizations that's out there and helping different groups of people get access to the tech community and get access to those tech careers. She is certainly an inspiration to everyone around New York City right now and keep getting things going and keep getting things happening uh, in New York uh, and keep at it. Thanks so much. Thank you. See ya.